At their, at their last conference in March, Bernie Sanders was their keynote speaker. Sister Giant and Blue America are presenting the Free Progressive Online Summit, which starts in a couple of weeks on February 23rd. And there are handouts there at the back near the registration table. I encourage you all to take one. And at that summit, Marianne will interview progressive congressional candidates from all over the country. She has recently started a video blog for The New Revolutionary in order to support, educate, activate, and inspire supporters of Bernie Sanders around the country. All information about these various activities can be found at Marianne.com. Please join me in welcoming Marianne Williamson. honor to be here with my friends Dan Weeks and with all of you and to be following the great Jill Stein and the marvelous panel that was on uh, before Jill. These conversations are so important. I have come to feel of the last uh, three decades of my career uh, not only to believe but really to see in very manifest um, ways uh, the power of a conversation especially today with the kind of social media and uh, other uh, ways we have through the internet of getting information out, something happens uh, when new conversations begin. That's how a society changes, that's how an individual life changes. There's a new conversation in your head, and then there's a new conversation in the society, and then that conversation reaches a critical mass, and something begins to explode. And we're living in explosive times. Um, it takes great personal sobriety and maturity and consciousness, I think, to hold that conversation in a way that the power uh, truly does express itself and ultimately unfold in very powerful and positive ways. There's a lot we could talk about uh, there. It's a little bit on the side, so I don't want to go into it uh, too much, uh, but because I want to come back to the democracy issue. But my main point here has to do with the fact that we are living <coughs> in very pregnant times. Uh, obviously, great power, uh, a great explosion of ideas. And the New Hampshire Rebellion is part of uh, a conversation that I believe is central to everything that is important. And that is because I believe that getting the money out of politics is the great moral challenge of our generation. It is the great moral challenge of our generation because the undue influence of money on our politics is the cancer underlying all the other cancers. We can talk about the uh, climate change and all the forces that keep us from dealing with climate change in the ways that we need to. We can talk about the privatization of prisons and all the forces uh, that make uh, so much money uh, off a, an actual increase in, in uh, prosecution of, of low-level crime in high-level ways. We can talk about various ways uh, in our country today that the common good is actually obstructed by actual governmental action, governmental action that should be taken that is not taken, as well as governmental action that are arguably should not be taken that is taken. Everything from wars to tax policy and so forth. And all of this comes down to the undue influence of money on our politics. Now, uh, Jill spoke as a doctor, and she talked about how uh, the money in politics is the uh, mother of all sicknesses, and I think we would all agree with her. And I'd like to talk to you about treating this particular sickness from a holistic perspective. And uh, that means that we realize there are the issues, spiritual issues, issues of the mind, issues of the spirit, issues of the body. And this idea of spirituality and, and its power to help us heal is extremely important both in terms of the body and in terms of a society. In terms of the body, we now know that when people attend spiritual support groups after the uh, diagnosis of a life-challenging illness that they get out of uh, they, they, their rate of recovery, um, twice as long after diagnosis. Twice as long people live who attend spiritual support groups live twice as long after diagnosis. People who are prayed for in intensive care units get out faster and so forth. We know that there is a, an actual beneficent effect on the immune system, the powers of prayer, the powers of meditation, the powers of forgiveness, spiritual support, and so forth. Now, how do you apply the spiritual dimension? What is the spiritual dimension in the healing of our democracy? Well, that goes back to the founding of our democracy. We're going back a few hundred years to the streets of London, 
and an aristocratic's car aristocrat's carriage was driving down the street. Now, in England, in those days, this would have been probably the 16, 1700s, um, in those days, uh, if an aristocrat's carriage uh, was riding down the street and you were not an aristocrat, you were legally bound to bow because, after all, an aristocrat was running by, uh, riding by. Now, let's talk about what an arist aristocracy means. An aristocracy <coughs> is a situation in which it is legally deemed certain people, a small group of people, are legally deemed entitled. They were entitled to the land, they were entitled to be educated, they were entitled to opportunity, and they were entitled to create a framework not only for their own uh, possible growth and expansion in terms of their life circumstances, but their children were as well. And <coughs> aristocracy meant that no one else had those entitlements. No one else was entitled to own land. No one else was entitled to ed be educated. No one else was entitled to expand their life circumstance, and no one else was entitled to think in any way, shape, or form that their children could ever rise above their own situation that they themselves, the parents, were in. So everybody who was not an aristocrat, and the aristocrats were a small portion of the population, anyone who was not an aristocrat was basically, while not a slave, certainly a serf, which is not much higher than a slave. Basically, their lives were to be spent serving the aristocracy. Now, one day in London, the aristocrat's carriage rode by, and there was a man in William Penn. And William Penn didn't bow. And guard came by and said, why didn't you bow? Didn't you see that that was an aristocrat's carriage? And William Penn said, my religion would not allow me to. William Penn was a Quaker. He said, my religion forbids any man to bow before any other man. Because of what the gentleman was saying here earlier about Quaker, Quaker philosophy, that there is an inner light within every man, every child, and every woman, and we are all equal in that light. And therefore, as a Quaker, he could not bow. Now, King George III, who would become famous for his unwise decisions, of course, George III decided after a while that William Penn was really becoming really an inconvenience for him and really an annoyance. He said, I've got to get rid of this guy. And his idea of a good way to get rid of him was to send him over to that America place, where, of course, he founded Pennsylvania. And we know how important uh, a role the Quakers of Pennsylvania, including William Penn, obviously played in the founding of our country. Our country was a complete repudiation a complete repudiation of the notion of an aristocracy. It turned the ancient regime on its head. And it says in our Declaration of Independence that God, all men are created equal. That right there, this is not just a civic principle. This is a sacred principle. This is a religious principle. This is a spiritual principle that all men are created equal. This is based on the idea, not only in Quakerism, but a universal spiritual core value, that in God, we are created equal and endowed by God with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So these are, these are revolutionary because they go so deep. This was not just about an evolution of our political history. This was also an evolution of the, the moral and spiritual consciousness of humanity. And that's why the founding of the United States had such an extraordinary uh, influence not only here in this part of the world but all over the world. So what you had was with the founding of the United States was revolutionary in every sense as the gentleman was saying earlier that it is our job uh, according to the, to the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven. So on earth we would create, this is the ideal, this is the concept that we would create on earth as it is in heaven to the best of our ability. A situation that is the complete opposite of an aristocracy is a situation where anyone, not, not based on who your parents were, not based on how much money you had, not based on your class, that rather by your own, by the strength of your own character and the power of your own efforts to the best of our ability, we would create a situation where anyone could thrive and anyone could expand their circumstances, and anyone could have hope that anything was possible for them and for their children. Now, from the beginning, there has been a, in many ways, tragic, at certain points, tragic irony, because there is a dichotomy between the fact that on one hand, 
There were men gathered not too far from New Hampshire, certainly representing New Hampshire as well, who risked their lives because if they, if that war, if the war for independence had not gone well, they would have been drawn and quartered. Drawn and quartered is why we have the injunction on Bill of Rights against cruel and unusual punishment. If Thomas Jefferson and, and George Washington and all of them had been caught to be drawn and quartered, you're hung upside down, and they take a sword and they basically just you know cut you open and they they take your organs out and as 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 you were dying, your last view is to watch your organs burning in front of you. So these men risk <laughs> their lives to sign this Declaration of Independence, declaring that all men are created equal, not just the aristocracy. All men are given by God the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <clears throat> However, some of those men owned slaves. So from the very, very beginning, it's in our DNA, this contest. This contest between the most enlightened principles that have ever been coded into the founding documents of a nation versus the fact that in practice, we have often expressed in repudiation of our own <coughs> principles some of the basest instincts of humanity. So you have these principles, and then you have slavery and the genocide of the Native American people, right? Now, the, the process of American history has been and continues to be that generation after generation, there are those who struggle, who fight, who effort to actually manifest in our social conditions, our political and economic conditions, the actual embodiment and actualization of our ideals. And there are forces have been in every generation, including ours, who do everything they can to resist that. Now, over time, over time, and this is the good news, we are heirs of a great legacy. Because over time, we have tended to self-correct. Yes, we had slavery, then we had the abolitionist movement, civil war, and the abolition of slavery. Women did not have the right to vote. Then we had the suffragette movement. Women were given suffrage. Then we had legalized segregation, white supremacy, institutionalized segregation in the American South. Then the civil rights movement arose. A generation rose up. That was corrected. Gay people were not allowed to marry, were not given equal rights. A generation rose up, and now they are. So we have always been this contest. But in time, as Winston Churchill said, you can always count on America to do the right thing after it has exhausted every other option. <laughs> and so now in our generation, at our time, we are part of a great legacy, a great trajectory. If, in fact, we are, as citizens, given the great mission and the great task of stewardship of our democracy, then that means that we are called in every generation to proactively either expand our democratic rights or protect our democratic rights. Always protect them, because there will always be those forces seeking to eat away at them. And that meant that we as, as a nation said, if all men are created equal, and if we are all given by God, the inalienable <coughs> rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, this can't just mean white people, therefore we can't have slavery. This can't just mean men, that's why women need the right to vote. It can't be coming back again, just white people. That's why we need civil rights legislation. It can't just mean straight people. That's why gay, uh, gay people have the right, should have the right to marry. And now, in our time, it cannot just mean rich people. It should also mean everybody else. Now, I want to stay with the spiritual basis of all this, if I might. And that is to remind you, you know the Quakers are great unsung heroes of American social justice. Not only was the Quaker ideal behind so much of the, the philosophy at the founding of American democracy, but also the abolitionist movement grew out of the Quaker movement. It was the Quakers who first laid that down. They were the beginning. And when Jill and, and Darren have spoken about the fact that, that what we're doing here today, this is how it always starts. 
It's groups of people. The point of this tent is that there are many such tents. You have the Democracy Spring that's happening uh, in April in Washington, D.C., and other organizations. In other words, it's a conversation here, and it's a conversation there, and it's a conversation here, and it's a Facebook over there, and it's an organization over there. This is what you see. And hello, a major presidential, two major presidential candidacies really based on this idea right now. So what we have is it, with the abolitionist movement growing out of the Quakers, then many of the leaders of the women's suffrage movement were Quakers. Then you have the civil rights movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King, a Baptist preacher, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So I think it's very important to, to remember that the spiritual communities and the spiritual impulse the spiritual calling at the center of democracy has always, on some level or another, been the source point for the great social justice movements in the United States. Because it is that sacred commitment, whether you think of this sacred commitment uh, in religious terms or even spiritual terms or not. You know, we are a religiously pluralistic nation. A woman uh, a few moments ago mentioned, and rightfully so, what is this with calling America a Christian nation? One of our first principles is that we are a religiously pluralistic nation. All of us, when we were children, learned how many people came over here for religious freedom. As Thomas Jefferson <coughs> said, whether a man believes in no gods or 20 gods, neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. And so whether it has to do with freedom of religion, or whether it has to do with the idea of e pluribus unum, this idea that we are to be many, many ethnicities, many cultures, but out of that we are one because of our fealty to common principles. Where it is the idea that our government is to be brokering between the protection of individual liberty or, and the concern for the common good. Then you add to that the first principle enunciated in the Gettysburg Address that we're to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And then you add to that, of course, this idea that all men are created equal and that that is the essence of democracy. That's why it matters. Not just so that you can get what you want. Not just so that you can get what you want. It's so that we can play our part as holders of this vision as carriers, as we receive it from our ancestors, some of whom struggled, some of whom even died, so that this would be manifest. We, we take it from them. It's like they throw the football to us, and we hold it in sacred keeping to hand it down to our children. And so that is so much a bigger mission. It comes from some place of, of spiritual, and you know, everybody's on a spiritual path. Some people just don't know it. All that a spirituality, spiritual, a spirituality is the path of the heart. And that's what makes it spiritual. It is heartfelt. When you say to people, when you think of the ancient regime, when you think of what preceded this democratic experiment, that if you weren't an aristocrat, forget it. There was no reason for you to have hope. And that this thing was created, this possibility, this is a mission for us. And so now in our time, no, we do not have institutionalized slavery in the United States, thank God. Yes, we have made much progress. Yes, women have the right to vote. Yes, gay people can get married. Yes, the civil rights legislation happened. But you and I both know, all know, that the struggles continue on many levels. It is important at times in our own personal growth, as well as our societal growth, that we do celebrate the good stuff that has happened, the strides that we have made. America hasn't done everything wrong. And like I said, in many ways, we, time after time, ultimately self-correct. But now this is our time. And we have a profound mission and we have a profound challenge as great as any generation before us. Because a government of the people, by the people, and for the people is no longer that. We are now a government of a few of the people, by a few of the people, and for a few of the people. Of the corporatocracy, by the corporatocracy, and for the corporatocracy, which has legalized corruption, which has legalized bribery. And as Jill was saying before, not only are people suffering because of this, People are dying because of this. People are dying because of this. They are dying in this country, and they are dying around the world. And you better believe it, it's a rebellion. And you better believe it, it's a revolution. We are called by God to do no less. we work in individual ways. But something interesting is happening right now. And this, once again, this is, this is true to all great social justice movements. 
And that is that there are people standing up in individual efforts. Dan Weeks with the New Hampshire Rebellion, Kai Newkirk with Democracy Spring, Jill Stein, all politicians who are standing on these issues, all the various people doing these kinds of organizations. We must, when people talk about joining together and alliances, I don't know about that. That can take a lot of time. Do what you feel moved to do. But we must have each other's back. That I do know. We must have each other's back. And never has there been a time in the cycle, more, a more important time, <coughs> when you hear that someone's doing something that's on this. Put it on your Facebook page. Put it on your Twitter. Tell your friends about it. And like Dan was saying earlier, you know, you might feel like, you know, what can one person do? This is not just about one person. Anytime we give any effort, like you've attended here today, but the issue is not for, you, for Dan and others who made the New Hampshire Rebellion happen, all the people who came to speak here at this, at this uh, weekend, all the people who have been involved or volunteering and helping. Those who have attended are hearing these talks. The issue is not just what happens here. To come to something like this is a battery charge. You know, when an idea is shared, it becomes strengthened. The issue is what happens when you leave here. What will happen now? When Dan talks about certain organizations, mind the, the oh, it's not up there, but the, the uh, we're doing an online progressive caucus, a free online progressive summit. What's that about? Well, it seems to me that the kind of people who, thank you, seems to me that the kind of people who have these kinds of ideas often get very, very involved in the hot and sexy presidential campaigns. But one of the things that the more regressive uh, forces in our country do is they, they don't just uh, put their attention on presidential campaigns. They're very much into putting their attention on congressional campaigns and senatorial campaigns and local campaigns. So if we really want this kind of change to happen, Jill was talking about certain local measures. She was talking about things that happened in Massachusetts. She was talking about getting public funding and then how that public funding was repealed in a secret vote behind closed doors. You can't just be vigilant every four years. You can't just be vigilant every six years. You can't just be vigilant every two years. Not when times are as tense and critical as these. We must be vigilant every day. We must go out. We're doing the online summit because it seems to me, obviously, you know, the presidency is just one of three co-equal branches of government. And so, no matter who wins the presidency, we need to, people be, to have people who carry these kinds of ideas and these kinds of convictions. We must make sure they're in Congress as well. And so, it's so important that you not just know who's running on these ideals in your state, but also who's running around the country. Because somebody might be running on these ideals in Nevada, or in Michigan, or in Florida, or in California, and you might want to send your $20 to them and so forth. So this is a time of a great awakening. It is a great awakening spiritually. And once again, it's the body and the mind and the spirit. So we've already talked about the spirit. The mind has to do with really thinking about these things, with being alive, with being awake. We are living at a time, especially with the internet, especially with the corporate-owned media. We are all at the effect of a barrage of meaninglessness coming at us all the time. It's coming at us in 24-hour cycles, this meaningless issue versus this meaningless issue. One of the issues there that's so significant and dangerous is that the traditional gatekeepers of, let's say, media, which should help us to, to prioritize and to have perspective. Now, in a corporate-run media, where all they want to do is to sensationalize everything in order to bring up ratings, they make things that aren't catastrophes sound like catastrophes, which makes things that are catastrophes seem like less of a catastrophe. And people in New Hampshire, certainly, I mean, I lived in Michigan for a long time. I was rolling my eyes at all the corporate media coverage of Blizzard 2016. A blizzard coming is not akin to the Japanese attacking World Har uh, Pearl Harbor. But it would get ratings. Why is this dangerous? First of all, because it breeds in people fear of everything. A blizzard, and I'm not minimizing it either. I've lived in Michigan. Serious weather conditions are significant but not catastrophic if handled well. But if we particularly raise a generation to think that everything that happens is a catastrophe, 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 first of all, it puts people in a permanent state of fear. 
but even more significantly, was here's Blizzard 2016 given the same weight in the media as lead poisoning in Flint, which was at because of actions of a government. These are two very, very different things. One has to do with nature and the storms of nature. Storms of nature happen in our minds and in our hearts. They are natural and they are necessary. Storms, what, what are we having here with the New Hampshire Rebellion? With this whole movement to get out of politics? It's a storm. And Jefferson said that storms are as necessary in culture and society and politics as anywhere else. And of course, storms in nature. On the other hand, something like lead poisoning of a disadvantaged community in Flint, Michigan, where the citizens themselves were not in leadership positions anyway because the state had taken over their democratic rights by a government that then decided in order to save money, they would let that happen. Let me tell you something. I lived in Michigan. I lived in Gross Point. It would never have been allowed to happen in Gross Point. And for those of you who know Gross Point, why is that? I assure you, the median income in Gross Point is so much higher than the median income in Flint. America doesn't work when only the rich get to say, stop right there. And what's happening right now, and it is Bernie Sanders who said this, and I love the line, we need everybody to say, no matter who we are. You know, in the body, Jill was talking about the body, it's very dangerous if blood isn't circulated. You can't have blood just in one part of the body, and you can't have a democracy when opportunity isn't, 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 isn't dispersed as well. You know, the free enterprise system has been good to me. I write books, I give seminars. The free enterprise system, this is not where the problem is. The problem is this unfettered, unregulated capitalism without any kind of ethical center at this point, which constantly puts profit over the problem is not that wealth and opportunity can be created in America today. Because the truth of the matter is, if you're in that game, what a wonderful country to live in. What's happening in America today is that not enough people can get in the game. It's not this issue that, that they don't want to. You have these kids loaded down by the student debt, people loaded down by health care laws. They'd love to have $2,500 in discretionary income so that they could start that website, so that they could get into the game. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not just anti-democratic. It is morally wrong. And we are called. I think that we are called by something more than the US Constitution. I think we are called by something more than the Declaration of Independence. I think we are called by something more than an ethical responsibility. I think we are called by something more than our honor, the due honor and respect to those who live before us, or even the due honor and respect and responsibility to those who live after us. I believe that we are called by the heart. We are called by the spirit. To many of us, that means we are called by God. Yes. America. <laughs> America is an ideal. America is an experiment. America is a process, but America is not guaranteed. Ask Rome, ask any great empire. And any person's life, any individual life, if you get out of your ethical center, if you get out of your righteousness, your right use of your human capacities, nature does not support it. And if America continues, why is it that America has been such a blessed nation? America has been such a blessed nation because we have been a blessing on the world at certain times in our history. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, God help us if karma is true, and I believe it is. God help us if cause and effect is true, because, uh, and I believe it is. God help us if we sow what we have reaped, we reap what we have sown over the last few decades. It's time for America to atone for our own sins, to atone for our own mistakes, to gain some humility, to be sorry in our hearts for the terrible things that have happened, some of which have happened under our, on, on our call and on our watch. And it's time for a great awakening, not only spiritually on this planet, but politically in this country and globally, by which those of us who have known we have not stood up in our strength, we have not stood up as fully conscious people, we have not stood up as truly, truly mature people, we have not stood up as the men and women that we could be, we have not stood up as the Americans that we could be. Go tell it to Winston Churchill, okay, we're late, but we're here now. No more of it. We're going to kick ass. Just watch what we're doing now.
Larry Williams, and thank you so much. And do not leave this town without your water bottle and your maple candy and your extra bunny hat. Once again, thank you, Larry Williams, and traveling all the way from Los Angeles to be with us. Mary was in DC yesterday, but came on up early this morning. We're so grateful.